Apache Kafka is a message broker. And Apache Kafka is a big data analytics platform. And Apache Kafka is also an integration middleware. Or is it not? This is what I will explore in this video. My name is Kai Wenner, and I work in integration and data streaming space for many, many years. So let's really make sure to understand the concept and the misconceptions behind Apache Kafka as a data streaming platform. First of all, I will explain what Apache Kafka is, because that's important to understand before we will also explore when you should not use Apache Kafka and complement it with other technology. So let's get started with what is Apache Kafka. And I always explain it in four different pillars. Number one, Kafka is messaging. This is often the obvious part, what most people understand. So what do you do? You send information to Kafka via messages. You have a producer. For example, this can be some Java code. And you send an event into the platform, into a business object, a customer, a payment, or maybe also a technical log of data, transactional data, or high volume data. Apache Kafka supports both. And then you can consume the data on the other side. And this could be, for example, a Python consumer that your data scientist uses in its notebook. So this is the core of Kafka, messaging for both transactional data and big data at extreme scale. This is great, but Kafka is much more than that. Number two is the event store. This is really a crucial difference to traditional message brokers, no matter if it's from the IT side, like IBM MQ or TIPCO, or from the OT and IoT side, like MQTT. With Apache Kafka, you store these events as long as you want to store them, and you can decide per business object. Like for the logs, we might only store them for 12 hours, because after that, we don't care about it anymore. For the customer data, well, maybe we start much longer, either forever or maybe for a year. 365 days. You can choose per business object and think about that in detail. With that, you have a retention of important business object and can replay them again and again and again. And you also truly decouple the environments from each other. So whenever you need to implement something like a domain-driven architecture or a microservice architecture or a modern data mesh with decoupled environments where you share the data product here with many different organizations or business units, no matter if they're real-time or batch or request response. The fundamentation of that is Apache Kafka at its core with its event store and true decoupling. However, we're still not here yet, so Apache Kafka is more. It's also an integration layer. Normally, when you have a message broker, the first thing you do is you add an ETL tool because not everything is real-time in streaming. And Apache Kafka provides Kafka Connect, and with that, you can directly connect to other systems that are not native Kafka consumers or producers. For example, that could be a mainframe. And the mainframe produces data into Kafka with an IBM MQ connector. At Confluent, we even deploy it onto the mainframe. And with this, you can connect to legacy, or maybe you use the Oracle Change Data Capture Connector. Oracle. Here we do CDC. We push our events in, no matter where they come from. And on the other side, it's the same for data integration to the consumer world. In this case, we're talking about a few cloud-native systems. For example, you might ingest data into a data platform like Snowflake. which is perfect for analytics, for reporting, and so on. And on the other side, you might have more transactional workloads that might go into a MongoDB. So the last part, however, and this is often a secret sauce in Apache Kafka, is stream processing. Stream processing with Kafka streams is also part of the ecosystem. When you download Apache Kafka, it's already included there, the same way like Kafka Connect. And this means you take data from different Kafka topics and correlate it in real time, 
stateless or stateful. So you take data here and from here and you have some business rules to correlate that. And then you take an action here. This is stream processing. This can combine data from real-time and non-real-time systems and build contextual decisions on top of that. Now we're finally done. And by the way, for stream processing, more and more people also use Apache Flink in combination with Apache Kafka. So instead of Kafka streams, they replace that with Flink, which is more or a more scalable server-side infrastructure. But that's a discussion for another video. With this now we understand what Apache Kafka is. It's messaging, an event store, data integration, and stream processing, all in one single platform for real-time data processing at any scale and reliably also for transactional data sets. With this knowledge now, we can finally come to the second part of the video to talk about when not to use Apache Kafka. Because with these capabilities, you can solve many problems, but not every problem. So let's take a look at the most critical questions I get all the time, where I explain, hey, this is where you can combine Apache Kafka with other tools and technologies. But Kafka alone is not good enough because it was never built for these use cases. Let's get started with the first one, analytics platform. And here, by the way, we can speak about databases, about data warehouses, about data lakes. None of them will go away. Kafka complements them. You ingest data into your database, data warehouse or data lake. But a lot of the analytics, especially for complex queries and for things like model training and machine learning and AI, that's where you use your analytics platform. Now, you might say Kafka, well, it's also a database. And that's actually true. You know, these topics here in Kafka, they use a tiered storage under the hood in the meantime. And with tiered storage, you can store high volume of data in Kafka long term, cost efficiently and scalable. For example, we have a customer in financial services who stores even petabytes in Kafka. But even with that in mind, this is not for analytics here. No, it's not. For analytics, you have use these specific technologies like Snowflake, for example, on this picture here. This is really crucial to understand. You store it there. You can also replay historical data in guaranteed ordering with timestamps. So it's great for use cases like regulatory reporting, for example, if you have an incident, it's already in the log in guaranteed ordering. But for most analytical use cases, you either use a stream processor for real-time processing and continuous processing of data in motion. But for any analytics at rest, you use another platform, a database, a data lake, a data warehouse. And again, this is why data integration is a key piece of Kafka. Almost all of our customers integrate with the analytics platforms out of the box with the data streaming platform. The next thing what Kafka does not do very well is integration with legacy technology. What does that mean? Well, that can mean many things. Like here we have seen the mainframe already, right? Um, where it's pretty easy actually to integrate with IBM MQ. But um, if you need to directly integrate with COBOL code, then it's a very different question. Or let's take a look at a few other examples, EDI or EDFACT, or something like SOAP Web Services. You remember this kind of strange complex thing before everybody used HTTP. Or maybe there is IoT protocols like Bucknet or Siemens S7 or all these kind of proprietary legacy standards from the OT space. Well, to get the data into Kafka, most of our customers do that, but actually they have another middleware here in the middle. So you use what you already have typically because legacy needed to be integrated for many years and decades already. And keep that as long as you need to keep integration with the middleware. And when you can shut down these systems here, then you can shut down the middleware too. So this is how you should integrate with any kind of legacy protocol. And the same, by the way, also for business applications. Like as long as you run SAP ECC on-prem, you should use your dedicated connectors for BAP or IDOC. But then when you go to the cloud for S4HANA, then you can directly integrate because the modern SAP then also has modern interfaces like an eventing API. The third example is the IoT last mile.
What does that mean? Last mile means something, for example, like a car. And I'm not good in drawing this here, right? But you know what I mean. It's cars that connect the devices, it's something like that. Same story here. In most cases, you have another middleware here to integrate to Kafka. But on the other side, you won't find many IoT architectures like connected cars where Kafka is not in the enterprise architecture. It's perfect after you have done the last mile integration. For example, with MQTT, almost always used for connected cars. Or use OPC UA for equipment and manufacturing. It doesn't matter, but the point is, for the last mile, you rarely use Kafka. Especially if two characteristics are true. Number one, thousands of interfaces. For cars anyway, right? It's typically more than millions. But even for equipment in the OT space, if you have thousands of them, Kafka is not a good thing to directly connect. You need a proxy like MQTT or HTTP in the middle or another IoT platform. And the same for bad networks. In this case, for bad networks, like on the street in a car, you use another proxy. Having said that, Kafka can deploy at the edge, so this is possible. Like in a factory, in a retail store, or even a single broker in a drone. We do this with many customers, but that's a very different discussion. But in general, basic rule of thumb, for IoT last mile, for thousands of devices or bad networks, you don't use Kafka directly. But on the other side, Almost all of these use cases feed the data into Kafka because then you can use either Kafka or Flink for stream processing to correlate the data continuously in real time at scale for use cases like condition monitoring, predictive maintenance, location-based services, and so on. The next one Kafka is not, it's not an API management solution. That's what many of you already have probably, either built by yourself or technologies like Mulesoft, Apigee, Kong, and so on. No matter if it's a cloud service or open source. But the point is that normally for some use cases you have an API. What does that mean API? Well, in our world it typically means to do a request and get a response back. And this is done with technologies like HTTP in most use cases, but could also be something like gRPC in a more modern, scalable way, but not supported by all interfaces and platforms. So in this case, if you need API management for lifecycle management, for direct connections to other APIs, this is where a technology like Mulesoft is great. And then you use that in the middle between Kafka and the rest of your enterprise architecture. It's still all decoupled, but this kind of last mile to the mobile app, for example, this is in the end where API management can come into play for the integration between the last mile, in this case the mobile app, and Kafka on the other side, and in between the API management, so that you can provide a good management and lifecycle for the API requests and scale this up independently. But still, all the other parts of your ecosystem are decoupled from this one. And all API management solutions can also integrate with Kafka. Because just doing point to point to everything else, that's nonsense. This is where Kafka is so much better in almost every architecture. The next part is about large files. This is a bit a controversial discussion because you can process any kind of file size with Kafka. And even in cloud offerings, like in Confluent Cloud, you can upload pretty big files, more like 20 megabyte, right? But um, in some other cases, like a video, you can do that with Kafka, because in the end, Kafka is just store and forward. It's a dump broker. So you can do that, and it works. We have some use cases at the edge where customers do that for video streaming of security cameras. But in most use cases, the rule of thumb is, you shouldn't process large files with Kafka, at least not in one big file. So let's assume here we have one big file big. And if we want to process that via Kafka, there's in the end two different options. Number one, if possible, it's the preferred approach to split this up. One line, second line, third line, and so on. Like if you have a CSV file, line by line feed that as event into Kafka. This is perfect. Even from a legacy system, you get into an event-based architecture with that. And a file connector, or for example, a CSV connector supports that. These are available. On the other side, 
If this kind of split is not possible, then the second best option is to use the, the climb check pattern. That means that you only store and share the metadata in Kafka. Metadata. And the file itself is stored in a big object store, like in Amazon S3, for example, and you just send the metadata with the link to that file. And this is another great design pattern. We see this being used a lot. For example, the big architectures like Netflix, they do this, for example. Of course, they don't stream the video files. They use a content delivery network and a complex architecture. But the metadata is all shared via Kafka between all these different systems. And last but not least, and this is also actually obvious for some people, but not so much for others, is Kafka is not hard real time. Some of you might not even have heard that term before. Hard real-time means that you have no latency. This is for safety-critical applications, like a robotical system. This is not Kafka, and this is not the IT world we are in here. So this is Rust, this is C, this is embedded systems. So if you have a robotic system, for example, oh, let's, let's draw one here, right? So we have the robotic system. And this is embedded systems. This is C or Rust under the hood. C or Rust. So this is not Kafka, this is not another competitive technology, and this is not cloud services, right? Because it's really hard real time, it's safety critical, and there cannot be any latency. However, then on the other side, they still need to communicate with the rest of the IT. And this is again where Kafka comes into play, because this is then again where we talk, for example, about OPC UA in the OT space. And therefore, you can complement this technology but it's not for the embedded system. And so we talked about several scenarios what Kafka is not good for. There is always some overlappings, especially for analytics, where you can do a lot of that in real time or in stateful applications with stream processing using Kafka Streams or Apache Flink as part of the data streaming platform. So here you need to always evaluate what's better for your use case and find the right one. For all the other ones, well, it's very often it's complementary. There's best practices, there is anti-patterns. So with this video, I want to show you when not to use Apache Kafka, or at least where the overlaps are, and there's always a gray zone and not black and white. So I hope this was a helpful video, and let me know in the comments about your feedback and your thoughts where you do use Kafka or where you don't use it. Thanks a lot for watching. This is Kai Weiner.